Aloha! Happy Easter! I hope you all had a wonderful Easter at your home. You know, I want to start out my video this week with a devotion, and it's going to be all about Easter. You know, sometimes people will ask me, they'll say, Mrs. Wilson, if you weren't a teacher, what would you like to be? And I thought about that, and I thought, well, I love to cook, and I would love to teach people how to cook. So today, I'm going to get a chance to do that. I'm going to do some cooking for you, and we're going to make some res resurrection cookies. And I'm hoping that through my devotion, you not only learn a cookie recipe, but you're going to remember the story of Easter. Well, it all starts out at the beginning of the story. I'm going to take a bag of pecans. These are nuts. Now, if I would be home, I would take a knife and I'd be chopping them up. But today, I'm teaching you about the Easter story. So I put them in a bag, and I'm going to take a rolling pin, and I'm going to be baiting on them. And this is going to help you remember that they beat Jesus before they put him on the cross. So this is going to make just a little bit of noise now. Wow, I didn't even hit it that hard. I can't imagine how hard they hit Jesus. Well, for just a minute, we're going to put this to the side. I also brought with me a bottle of vinegar. Now, if I take off the lid and I smell it, ooh, <laughs> that's pretty strong. It's kind of a sour and bitter, and um, I definitely would not want to take a drink of this. But that's what they gave to Jesus. When he got thirsty, they dipped a sponge in vinegar and they put it up to his lips, and I'm sure it didn't taste good. Because this is part of the Easter story, I'm going to put it in my cookies. So we need about a teaspoon of vinegar, and we're going to put it in my mixing bowl. The next thing we're going to use are some eggs, and you'll see some eggs right in front of me. Now eggs remind us of life. Little chicks are born out of eggs. Little ducks are born out of eggs. Well, today, I only want the egg white. So what I'm going to do is crack it in here, and it's going to separate the yolk from the white. So we're going to put the white in there. Take a little fork. There we go. And the yolk in there. And let's do one more. Separate it out. Give it a little shake, and you notice all I'm taking is the white. These egg whites remind us of life, and Jesus gave up his life for us. So that's why I'm putting that in there. We're going to set that to the side for a minute. Now right now, I'm going to take some salt. And if I take salt and I put it in my hand, and I take a little taste, it wouldn't really taste that good, just plain salt. Well, in the Bible, when Jesus cried, I'm sure his tears were salty. So I'm going to put in just a little bit of salt in here to remind us of his salty tears. Now, if I mix this up, so far, I don't think it's going to be that great. It's not going to taste very good. So I need to put in something sweet. I have a little bit of sugar in here. I'm going to measure some out in my cup. And I'm going to add some sugar to this. This reminds us of the sweetness of God's love. He loves you so much that he was willing to die for you. That's a sweet part of the story. Now I'm going to take this for just a minute and I'm going to stir this up. And what happens when I'm at home, I used a big mixer and it stirred it up really quickly. Right now I just have a little whisk, and what that whisk does is it puts air in there, and guess what? The more I stir it, the more air gets in there, and the whiter it gets. Now, at home it took me about 10 minutes to get it as white as I wanted, so I'm not going to do that today. But you can see, I'm just going to stir it a little bit, and you can see already it's starting to turn white. So right now you're going to have to use your imagination and pretend that I got it really, really white and fluffy. 
You know, that whiteness reminds us of a verse in the Bible that says our sins are whiter than snow. That means our sins are gone. Jesus erased them. He took our punishment for us. That's why our sins are gone. Well, if you remember at the beginning, I chopped up some nuts. So I'm going to put those in here right now. And we're going to stir this up. And mix that all together. Now at home, it was all white and putting in those nuts. Those nuts are going to represent the rocks, the rocky tomb that they put Jesus in. Well, let me show you what happens here. I'm going to take this and put it away and bring out my cookie sheet. What I did is I took the dough and I put it in little mounds on here. And if you look real carefully, you can see the little rocks. Those are the little nuts that I put in here. So last night, after I put the dough on my um, cookie sheet, I put it in my hot oven. And then I shut my oven off. And I taped my oven door shut. And I told my husband, don't open that oven door all night. Just leave it in there. And that reminds us of the tomb. They sealed the tomb shut. Just like I sealed my oven shut. And that reminds me of Jesus being sealed in the tomb. Well, I think my husband wanted to get in there this morning because he kept asking me, can I open it now? And I said, yes, you can open it now. So after it had been in there all night, we took off the tape, we opened my oven door, and this is what it looked like. And my husband asked me, he said, why do you call it resurrection cookies? And I said, listen, each one of these mounds reminds us of the rocky tomb that Jesus was in. Now I carefully took a knife and I opened it up and if you can see, inside here, there's a hole. And in each one of these, you're going to see an empty space. That reminds us of the empty tomb. Jesus was gone. This isn't solid, full of things. Just like the tomb, Jesus wasn't there anymore. It was empty. And if you make this at home and you take a bite into it, you're going to notice in each one, there's an empty space. You know, right now, things are kind of different in our world. At, I'm at school and it's empty. Our church this morning, Easter morning, it was empty. The roads are empty and it might make you feel a little sad. But today, I want you to change that. When you see something that's empty, I want you to remember the empty tomb. And that is very good news. That's not sad at all. Jesus overcame death. Can you imagine that? That means we also can overcome death. We're not going to stay in our tombs. Our soul and spirit will be with Jesus in heaven. Well, I want to close today by showing you something that I usually have at my home. You know, at Christmas time, a lot of people will set out a nativity scene where they have the wise men and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph. And I do that also. But at Easter time, I set out a scene that reminds me of Easter. So here I have the three crosses, and this rock is supposed to represent Golgotha. That's the hill that Jesus died on. Now I want you to really pay attention here. There's something wrong over here. Now take a look carefully. Do you see something that's missing or isn't quite right? I can just hear some of you saying, look at Jesus. His hand is missing. You know, that happened a couple of years ago when a student in my classroom took, I had this set up and he took it and accidentally broke his hand off. And I thought about it and I thought, well, I could buy a new one. And I thought, nope, I'm not going to. Because this is a good reminder that Jesus wants us to be his hands and his feet. You know, Jesus used his hands to serve others. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be his hands and feet and serve other people. You know, right now you may not be able to go out and talk to people or um, get together, but you can send them letters. You can get on the computer and talk to them. You can talk on the phone and say, hey, I care about you. Jesus cares about you. How are you doing? 
When you do things like that, you're serving, just like Jesus wants us to serve others. Okay, let's close by folding our hands, and let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, please help us to serve you, just like you served us. Thank you for being willing to die for us. But we know death didn't keep you. The tomb is empty, and you rose from the grave. And now that empty tomb reminds us of the joy that we'll have with you someday in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, right now I want to do a little bit of math with you. I've been looking through your lessons for this week, and I just want to go over some things that I know that are new. They're going to be talking about units of weight in one of your lessons. And so this um, morning I brought some examples with me. This box is empty right now. It's a pasta box, but I want you to pretend it's full of pasta. And if you look at the bottom, it says one pound. That means when this is full of pasta, that's about one pound. And I'm gonna, I wrote these words behind me, pound. This one, if you fill this up with water, that's one ounce. So you can see a pound is definitely more than an ounce. Now, I didn't want to ruin this pencil, but if I took a scissors and I just cut out the eraser, and I just had the eraser in my fingers, that would be about one gram. A gram is really, really tiny. I know on your math, they're going to ask you to start with the smallest and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So if I gave you all four of these words, which one do you think would be the smallest? And you're right, it would be that little gram. So that would be the first one. Which one do you think would be just a little bit bigger than a gram? An ounce, you're right. Now we have two left, a pound and a kilogram. Now I told you this is about one pound when it's full of pasta. A pound is a little bit less than a kilogram. A kilogram is just a little bit more than a pound. So this would be three. And number four, the kilogram, that would be the largest one. If you forget, I'm going to leave this here, and you can come back and look at that. They're also going to go over some new Roman numerals for you right now. But the rules are still the same that we learned at the very first lesson. They're going to talk about L equals 50, C equals 100. Now remember, when a little one comes after a big one, you add. And when a little one comes before a big one, you minus. So let's do some of these. L is 50, X is 10. So in this case, you're going to add because the little one comes after the big one. So 50 plus 10, that would be 60. But let's switch it. What if I made the little one come before the big one? Then you're going to have to minus. So that would be 50 minus 10 would be 40. I bet you can do this one without me. L is 50 and X is 10. So let's add that. 50, 60, 70, 80. All right, this one try without me. Here's a little one before a big one. 10, and that one's 100. So what's 100 minus 10? Yes, you're right. 90 is correct. So let's come down here and get really big. M is 1,000, D is 500. So if I have CM, that's a little one before a big one, so what's 1,000 minus 100? 900. Let's do it backwards. What if I switch these around? MC. So now it's 1,000 plus 100. So in this one, you would need a comma. 1,100. Let's do the same thing here. CD, and then I switched it around. DC. So here we have 100, a little one, before the 500. So remember to minus, and the answer is 
400. I know you got that. Well, here's the little one after the big one. So 500 plus 100 would be 600. I think you're going to do well on your Roman numerals this week. There is one part, and it's on page 232. When you get to that this week, on number two, it's going to say, write the answer in two ways. And I'm going to give you some examples. They're talking about money, and there's more than one way to write money. So I want your parents to make up a number. So let's say 55 cents. Well, of course, all of you can write 55 cents with a cent sign. But they want you to write it two ways. So another way you could do this is using a dollar sign and a decimal point. There's no dollars, so don't write any dollars. Remember, dollars go on this side, cents go on this side, and remember our secret, there always has to be two numbers here. So if it's 55 cents, you would say point 55. That's another way to write that. So let's try this one. Say 62 cents. This I know you all can do. Another way to write that would be with a dollar sign and a decimal point. There's no dollar, so leave that blank, and it would be point .62. Sometimes I've seen kids want to do them together and put a dollar sign, and then maybe they'll put a cent sign at the end like that. Don't do that. You want to do one or the other, but you don't want to do them both together. This one I'm going to make just a little bit harder for you. Let's say three cents. Well, I know you all can write it like that. But let's think. A dollar sign and a decimal point. Well, you put a dollar sign and a decimal point. But remember a rule. There has to be two numbers after a decimal point. That means one of them is going to be zero. So if I wanted three cents, I would put point zero three. All right, I think you'll do pretty well on that. Let me just check one more thing. And I think the rest your parents will do all right on. If you do have a question, have your parents take a picture of that question with their phone, text it to me, and then I can always write back and help you with that. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a minute and come back in just a little bit with our language. Alright, this week in language, most of your lessons are going to be about how to write a letter. And the first thing you're going to need to know are the parts of a letter. So up here, I just put the words. You have the date, the greeting, that's like dear mom or dear dad. The main part of the letter where you write your message is called the body. At the closing, that's where you write from or love or your friend. And then the signature, that's where you write your name. Now there are some things I want you to notice about this. Do you notice that if I made an invisible line from the date and went straight down, see how the date, the closing, and the signature, they're all over about the same distance. Now I'm going to try something right now. You're pretty smart. So I want you to just take a picture of this in your brain. And I'm going to erase these words, and instead of words, I'm going to put some blanks. And we're going to see if you can remember the name of all of these. All right, I'm going to point to one, and I want you to say the name at home, what you think it is. So let's start out kind of easy. We'll go in order. So the first one is date, greeting. Body, closing, signature. Now, I want to mix these up, and I want you to say it out loud at home while I'm doing this. Ready, go. Body, date, closing, date, closing, date, greeting, 
signature. I'm going to do it one more time and I'm going to go faster. So ready? Get ready. Go. Signature. Closing. Date. Closing. Signature. Date. Greeting. Body. Okay, that was pretty good. Now, in every single letter, there has to be at least three commas. And I want to talk about that because that's something that you'll be graded on. In the date, there's always a comma. So, if I said April 10th, there's always a comma between the day and the year. So, there's one comma. But I said there was three commas in every letter, at least three commas. When I say dear, we'll say dear mom, no matter what your greeting is, there should always be a comma at the end of it. And your closing, if you said from or love, at the end of your closing, put a comma. So every time you write a letter, you should see, do you have one, two, three commas? All of those should be there. Now, did you notice something when I made the body of this letter? Look at the first line. It's a little bit shorter than these two lines. I did what's called indent. I indented that line. That means I pushed it in a little bit. You know, a way to remember that word is if you have a car, and sometimes you've seen a car with a dent in the side, that means maybe they ran into something and they pushed it in a little bit and made a dent. Well, this is called indent. It means we're pushing that line in a little bit. And the first line of the body, or a paragraph, should always be pushed in a little bit. I think your parents will be able to help you with this. I'm hoping you not only do the papers that I sent home about writing a letter, but it would be great if you could write a letter to your mom or your dad or your tutu or your auntie or someone and encourage them and use everything that you learned. Well, besides writing letters this week, I noticed on your science paper they're going to have some diagrams like this. And since we haven't done this a lot, I just want to do one example with you. Let's say this circle represents the ocean and this one represents a river. What's something that only true about the ocean you put here. Something that's only true about a river put here. But if it's true about both of them, then you're going to put that right in the middle. So I'm going to do a few examples with you. So ocean has salt water, so you could put that there. A river has fresh water. An ocean is large. You could say rivers, I would describe those as lawn. But there's nothing in here. I want to think of something that we could put in the middle. So let's say the word water. Water is in both the ocean and the river. So you would put that in the middle. Maybe you want to write the word fish. There's fish in the ocean. There's fish in a river. That would go in the middle part. Um, I'm thinking of plants. There are some plants that grow in the ocean, some that grow in rivers. Those would all be in the middle part. Today, when you get to your um, geography papers, there's going to be the directions. And remember the little th ways we learn to remember the directions. Okay, north, south, east, west. And I know some of you made up your own too. Never eat shredded wheat. Some of you like to do the one with worms. Never eat soggy worms. And some of you made up some great ones on your own, but those are just little ways to remember that. They're also going to talk about the Great Lakes this week. And there's a special way that I use to remember them. May I think of the word homes. If you write the word homes down the side, each letter is the first letter of a Great Lakes name. The Great Lakes, there are five of them. Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. 
We're going to talk more about those later on. But if you look over here on my map, you'll see where those five great lakes are. And your mom or dad could even pull that up on their computer to show you where each lake is located. These are some of the biggest lakes we have in our country, and I want you to know about them. This week, I just want you to try and work on remembering their names and knowing where they're at. Then they're going to ask you some fun things, too, this week. They're going to give you four examples, and they're going to give you a question. So this one they're going to say, what is made from something that once lived? Now there's only one right answer. See, glass. Glass was made from sand. That wasn't living. Ice cube. Hmm. Ice cube's made from water. That's not alive. Well, a fork. A fork is made out of metal. That's not alive. But what's a book made out of? See, a book's made out of paper. And where do we get paper? From trees. I can just hear you at home. So for this one, you would circle the answer book. That actually came from something that was living. Well, I also got out my globe. They're going to be talking about the globe on your geography papers this week. And some of the questions I know are going to be really easy for you. Like they're going to ask you, is there more water or land? And if you look at this, you can see how much blue there is. So the globe definitely has more water. But there's one question that you might not know. They're going to ask you about the North and South Pole. Well, the South Pole is way at the bottom. And if you can see, the continent way on the bottom of the Earth is Antarctica. So the North, the South Pole, excuse me, is right on Antarctica. It's on land. But if you go to the North Pole at the very top, do you know what? The North Pole is not on land. It's actually water. It's just all ice. All right. I have a feeling you'll do well on your papers. And if you have trouble, you're welcome to call me, email me, um, send me a text, and I'll do my best to help you. All right. Can't wait until I see you next week. Bye.